Though general aviation, which is defined as all domestic civilian flights except scheduled commercial trips, has become safer since the 1970s, it remains much more dangerous than commercial flight. National statistics on general aviation accidents are kept by the National Transportation Safety Board and the Federal Aviation Administration, the FAA. Since the 1970s, these stats show improvements in safety, including a 75% drop in total deaths from general aviation accidents, according to Steve Hodges, a spokesman for the Air Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association, AOPA, a general aviation advocacy group. However, this isn't to say that all planes are as safe as the one before it. The statistics show that small planes are involved in more accidents and have a higher number of fatalities. But what makes charter planes more susceptible to crashes? The reason why small planes are considered less safe and are involved in more accidents comes down to the very nature of flying a smaller plane and the problems and challenges that it poses, as well as pilot error too. ExecutiveFlyers.com has broken it down into the top five reasons smaller charter planes are more dangerous. 1. Pilot Error To be eligible for a private pilot license, which allows a pilot to carry as many passengers as the aircraft can legally carry, 35 to 40 flight hours must be logged. Compare this to a commercial pilot license, which requires 190 to 250 flight hours, and it's easy to see why inexperience is one of the leading causes of aviation accidents. Number two, redundancies. Larger planes are more complex and therefore have more redundancies in place to protect against everything from electrical faults to lightning strikes. Some of the more advanced planes go so far as featuring three flight computers that function independently of each other, with each containing three different processors manufactured by different companies. Larger planes also have more advanced safety systems, like traffic advisory and avoidance systems, along with terrain avoidance, predictive wind shear warning, and de-icing systems. Number three, wake turbulence. While all forms of aircraft are designed to be able to withstand most turbulence, smaller planes in particular are susceptible to wake turbulence. Wake turbulence is the turbulence that forms behind an aircraft as it moves through the air, causing wingtip vortices. A smaller aircraft, whether during the takeoff, climb, following, approach, or landing stage of the flight, can get caught up and be affected by the turbulence. In some cases, it can cause a total loss of control of an aircraft. Number four, weather. In the event of less than ideal weather conditions, larger planes typically have no problem escaping or powering through it due to their size and more powerful engines, or simply by climbing above it. Smaller planes, on the other hand, are lighter, not equipped with as powerful engines, and are unable to climb due to the lack of pressurization systems. And number five, wildlife strikes. According to the FAA, in the USA between 1990 and 2019, there have been approximately 227,000 wildlife strikes with a civil aircraft. A wildlife strike is a collision between an animal and an aircraft which is in flight or on a takeoff or landing roll. The vast majority of these strikes have been at lower altitudes, which is the airspace in which small planes operate. According to the FAA, in 2017, General Aviation Aircraft logged a total of 21.7 million flight hours with a fatal accident rate of 0.931 per 100,000 hours. U.S. Airlines racked up 19 million hours without a single fatality. And when it comes to a life lost in a charter plane, this week we discuss the history of Buddy Holly and his 1957 hit, Every Day. Than a roller coaster. Hello, and welcome on back to Hurting in a Love Song, the show where we take a trip to the past to look into the history of a love song we all know and love. My name is Richard Hunt, and this week, in part two of... The day the music died. We are taking a look into the history of another life lost way too early, the massively influential Buddy Holly, and one of his most well-known songs, Every Day. And now we have some young singers who are creating a great deal of excitement in the Paramount Theater here in New York. Now, if you haven't heard of these young men, then you must be the wrong age because they're rock and roll specialists. Now, no matter what you think of rock and roll, I think you have to keep a nice open mind about what the young people go for. Otherwise, the youngsters won't feel that you understand them. Now, if we're ready for our rock and roll specialists, we have Buddy, Holly, and the Crickets. 
We start our story on September 7th, 1936, in Lubbock, Texas, about 350 miles west of Dallas. That is where and when we meet up with Lawrence Odell, L-O, Holly, H-O-L-L-E-Y, who worked at various times as a cook, carpenter, tailor, and clothing salesman, and his wife, Ella Pauline Drake. These two were at their home at 19116th Street in Lubbock, awaiting the birth of their fourth child a baby boy named Charles Harden Holly, younger brother to Larry, Travis, and Patricia Liu. He wouldn't go by Charles for long, as his parents decided to call him Buddy, which was a popular nickname for the youngest in the family. His mother was quoted as saying that the name Charles Harden Holly was too long for such a small boy. The youngest of the four children, Buddy followed his mother and siblings in learning to play a variety of instruments, guitar, violin, and piano, to accompany the country and western gospel singing that filled their Baptist household. During his early childhood, Holly was influenced by the music of Hank Williams, Jimmy Rogers, Hank Snow, Bob Wills, and the Carter family. In 1941, the three Holly brothers entered and won a local music contest. Larry played the fiddle, Travis played the accordion, and five-year-old Buddy played a small violin. They won the $5 first place prize, performing a cover of Did You Ever Go Sailing on the River of Memories. With inflation, that comes out to about $95 in 2022. Later that year, both Travis and Larry joined the Marines, with World War II robbing Buddy of his two older brothers. But in 1945, the war was over, and upon his return, Travis brought with him a guitar he had bought from a shipmate while serving in the Pacific. He would use that very guitar to teach Buddy how to play. Buddy began taking an interest in the piano when he was 12 years old, although he ditched the lessons fairly quickly, but his good ear for music enabled him to quickly play and sing just about anything he heard on the radio. There is even a 1949 recording of him at 13 years old covering Hank Snow's My Two Time and Woman. Buddy's parents initially bought him a steel guitar, but he insisted that he wanted a guitar just like his brother's. His parents bought him an acoustic epiphone from a pawn shop, and Travis taught him to play it. He also learned how to play banjo and mandolin during this period. It was also around this time that Buddy met and became friends with Hutchinson Junior High classmate Bob Montgomery. Bob was already playing guitar, and their love of music drew them together. Buddy began practicing guitar with Bob singing lead, and Buddy would harmonize. The duo were soon in demand locally and were influenced not only by country and western music, which bounded on the radio in that region, but also by bluegrass artists like Bill Monroe and blues artists like Lightning N. Hopkins, Muddy Waters, and Little Walter. It was this unique blend of inspiration that set them apart from the hundreds of other hopeful musicians around the area. In 1951, Dave Stone booked them for a guest spot on his radio show, Sunday Party. This led to other bookings and finally to their own program, The Buddy and Bob Show. DJ Hip Pockets Duncan heard them and recognized their potential. He encouraged them to add a bass player, Larry Wellborn, and as a trio, they began to to widen their repertoire. While attending Lubbock High School, Buddy studied printing and drafting and worked part-time at Panhandle Steel Products. By 1954, he had left Lubbock High School and was determined more than ever to make it in music. The rhythm and blues that he heard on the radio had tremendous impact on him, as it did countless other white teenagers in the racially segregated United States of the 1950s. Among the rhythm and blues records that seemed to have influenced him most were Work With Me Annie by Hank Ballard and the Midnighters, Bo Diddley by Bo Diddley. And Love is Strange by Mickey and Sylvia. Already well-versed in country music, bluegrass, and gospel, he became a tried-and-true rhythm and blues advocate. And by 1955, after hearing Elvis Presley, Oh, brother, this guy stinks! He was a fully rounded musician. On October 14th, 1955, Buddy and Bob were booked to appear as a support act to Bill Haley and his Comets in a show booked by the local radio station. They were heard by a Nashville-based agent, Eddie Crandall, who was also Marty Robbins' manager. The following day, they opened a show for Elvis Presley at Lubbock's Cotton Club. When Randall approached Decker Records for a recording contract for the Buddy and Bob trio, it seemed that they were really in the right place at the right time. And as fate would have it, Decker was interested, but not in the trio, only in Buddy Holly. This left an agonizing decision. Bob insisted that Buddy accept, and he reluctantly agreed. Oddly enough, this was where the E in Hollywood would be dropped due to a misspelling on his contract. Regardless of the name flub, this was huge for Buddy, because Decca was, and would remain, a powerhouse for well-known artists. Artists like Brian Adams, Louis Armstrong, Fred Astaire, Chuck Berry, David Bowie, Nat King Cole, Bing Crosby, Scammon Carruthers, 
Bobby Darren, Sammy Davis Jr., Duke Ellington, Ella Fitzgerald, Judy Garland, Genesis, Billy Holiday, Al Jolson's racist ass. Oh, brother, this guy stinks! Led Zeppelin, Loretta Lynn, Paul McCartney, Morrissey. Oh, brother, this guy stinks! Donny Osmond, The Rolling Stones, and Yusuf slash Cat Stevens. Deco was really hoping that Buddy would emulate the success of RCA's Elvis Presley, whose single Heartbreak Hotel had been released a few weeks before. They were also hoping he would follow in the footsteps of their other high-riding star, Bill Haley, whose song See You Later, Alligator was charting at the time. On January 26, 1956, Buddy recorded four songs. Those songs wouldn't be released until April 1956. The first two were Blue Days, Black Nights. Blue days, black nights, blue tears keep on falling for you, dear. With Love Me on the B-side. Well, love me, love me. Love me. And a few months later, the label released the second set of songs, Modern Don Juan. They say I'm a modern Don Juan. Backed with You Are My One Desire. You are my one desire. Neither single made an impression. In July, Buddy returned with drummer Jerry Allison to record five more titles, the most important of which was That'll Be The Day. None of these recordings were released for over a year. Cause be the day when I die. On January 22, 1957, Decca informed Holly his contract would not be renewed, but insisted he could not record the same songs for anyone else for five years. Buddy and Jerry Allison continued to rehearse and explore new ideas. In February, they, along with new bass player Joe B. Malden and rhythm guitarist Nicky Sullivan, traveled to Clovis, New Mexico, to the studio of producer Norman Petty. Roy Orbison and the Rhythm Orchids had launched their own successful recording careers from Petty's studio under his guidance, and they too would need his guidance, as they were a newly formed quartet, Buddy Holly and the Crickets. Of course, I'm just a cricket singing away from hearth to hearth. There are many theories as to just how they chose the name the crickets. It wasn't an odd name, as many early rock and roll groups chose names based on birds, jewels, flowers, and astronomical objects. Buddy decided to consider an insect for the group's name. And according to Nick Sullivan, Jerry came up with the name of the crickets. He said, well, you know, they make a happy sound. They're a happy type of insect. I remember him saying too, they make music by rubbing their legs together, and that cracked us up. We tried some other names, but we finally settled on the crickets. The crickets found their home at Norvajack Studios. That is where they would record a new rock and roll take on That'll Be The Day. Yes, that'll be the day. When you make me cry. For a fun fact here, That'll Be The Day takes its title from a phrase that John Wayne's character uses repeatedly in the movie The Searchers. That'll be the day. Buddy was so impressed with Norman Petty's production methods and his knowledge of the business that he asked Petty to become the group's manager. Petty accepted and later remembered, Although I discovered Buddy, I let him go his own way. I was no magician. Where Buddy was concerned. You don't create talent, it's there. Petty offered the demo tapes to Roulette and Columbia Records, both of whom showed no interest. And finally, he sent the tapes to Coral Records. Coral was a subsidiary of DECA, the very same company who had dropped Holly a few months earlier. On May 27, 1957, the group's first single, That'll Be the Day, was released using the original Clovis demo tapes. Now, in 1957, artists were usually limited to four singles a year. However, Buddy Holly was larger than life, and this wasn't a large enough outlet for Buddy. So, along with Petty, they hatched a plot which would enable the Crickets to have their records released on the Brunswick label, another subsidiary of DECA and Buddy's solo records on Coral. To bolster the success of That'll Be The Day, Holly and the Cricket spent the intervening months touring the country in packaged shows with other artists. They became one of the first white acts to play at Harlem's famous Apollo Theater and had appearances on such television programs as American Bandstand and The Ed Sullivan Show, which further increased their visibility. On September 20th, Coral released Peggy Sue. If you knew Peggy Sue, then you know why I feel blue. Backed with Every Day. More on that later. Peggy Sue was originally entitled Cindy Lou, after Holly's niece. The title was later changed to Peggy Sue, in reference to Peggy Sue Garan, the girlfriend and future wife of Jerry Allison, after the couple had temporarily broken up. The Cricket's second single, Oh Boy, backed with Not Fade Away, You know my love not fade away. 
was released in October 1957 and sold close to a million copies. Dubbed The Chirping Crickets, the debut album by The Crickets was released on November 27, 1957. Holly and The Crickets performed That'll Be The Day and Peggy Sue on The Ed Sullivan Show on December 1, 1957, but following the appearance, Nicky Sullivan left the group because he was tired of the intensive touring and he wanted to resume his education. On December 29th, Holly and the Crickets performed Peggy Sue on the Arthur Murray Party. Over the next few months, the Crickets toured Australia, Florida, and Great Britain as a trio, before Holly asked Tommy Alsop to join as lead guitarist of the group. Their third single, Maybe Baby, Maybe Baby, that's fun to say. Maybe Baby, I'll have you, Maybe Baby, you'll be Backed with Tell Me How, also cracked the top 100. Returning to the States, they immediately set off on another tour under Alan Freed. The package contained Chuck Berry, Frankie Lyman, and Jerry Lee Lewis. In 1958, the first Buddy Holly solo album was released, the eponymously named Buddy Holly. It was unique in that Buddy appeared on the cover without his now iconic glasses. And I had no other place for this little anecdote, but it ties directly into his glasses. At the beginning of their music careers, Holly and his band wore business suits. When they met the Everly Brothers, Don Everly took the band to Phil's Men's Shop in New York City and introduced them to Ivy League clothes. The brothers advised Holly to replace his old glasses with horn rim glasses, which had been popularized by Steve Allen. Holly bought a pair of glasses made in Mexico from Lubbock optometrist Dr. J. Davis Armistead, and the rest is history. In June of 1958, he went to New York and recorded two songs by Bobby Darin, Early in the Morning and Now We're One. They were recorded not only without the association of Norman Petty, but without the crickets as well. It was around this time that Buddy met Maria Elena Santiago, a native of Puerto Rico who had gone to New York as a child to live with her aunt after the death of her mother. Maria was the receptionist at Pure Southern Music when Holly and the crickets stopped in for a business meeting. Holly asked her out that very same night and over dinner at PJ Clark's asked her to marry him. She accepted and they were married on August 15th at Holly's home in Lubbock. In October, after another tour, he announced that he was moving to New York. The couple settled in at apartment 4H of the Brevoort Apartments at 11 Fifth Avenue in Greenwich Village. The couple would frequent many of New York's music venues, including the Village Gate, Blue Note, Village Vanguard, and Johnny Johnston's. Maria later said that Buddy was keen to learn the fingerstyle flamenco guitar and that he would often visit her aunt's home to play the piano there. Holly planned collaborations between soul singers and rock and roll artists. He wanted to make an album with Ray Charles and Mahalia Jackson. He also had ambitions to work in film and registered for acting classes with Lee Strasberg's Actors Studio. Things were changing rapidly, and Buddy was worried about the fate of the band, and for good reason. He wanted the Crickets to stay in New York. They were exploding and showed no signs of slowing down. Norman Petty, however, convinced Jerry Allison and Joel Malden to stay in Clovis. Holly reluctantly agreed to the breakup of the Crickets and was determined to carry on alone. In October 1958, Holly, producer Dick Jacobs, and studio musicians, including a string section, recorded what would be the final tracks Buddy Holly would record in studio. True Love Ways, It Doesn't Matter Anymore, written by Paul Inca, Raining in My Heart, and Moon Dreams. Raining in My Heart was extremely inventive, with a touching melody reinforced by the orchestral arrangement in which strings were used to emulate tearful raindrops. But it's raining, raining in my heart. In December 1958, Holly, now living in New York with his wife, recorded six acoustic songs at his home on his tape recorder, presumably to be re-recorded in the studio at a later date. Those songs included Crying, Waiting, and Hoping, Crying, waiting, hoping you'll come back. and What to Do. What to do now that she doesn't want me, that's what haunts me. In January 1959, he agreed to go on tour again as part of what was billed as the Winter Dance Party. He was accompanied on the tour by Alsup, bassist and future superstar Waylon Jennings, and drummer Carl Bunch. The tour promoters rather unscrupulously billed his group as the Crickets. Also starring Richie Valens, The Big Bopper, Dion on the Belmonts, and the unknown Frankie Sardo, the tour began on January 23, 1959 in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. But again, that's a story for a little bit later. Let's reel it back a bit and talk about this week's topic. Love like yours will surely come my way. Every day, a song written in 1957 served as the B-side to what is arguably his most well-known song, Peggy Sue. But in the years since, the song has gone on to become a classic in its own right. It features an acoustic bass, acoustic guitar, 
vocals and an odd keyboard glockenspiel hybrid called the Celesta. It looks similar to an upright piano, 4 or 5 octave, with smaller keys and a much smaller cabinet, or a large wooden music box. The keys connect to hammers that strike a graduated set of metal, usually steel, plates, or bars suspended above wooden resonators. Four or five octave models usually have a damper pedal that sustains or damps the sound. The three octave instruments do not have a pedal because of their small tabletop designs. The Celesta has been used in many other well-known songs, including I'll steal my daddy's cue and make a living out of playing fool. Dad's in the night. He told me I was going to lose the fight. Come with me and you'll be in a world of pure imagination. However, it's the curious percussion that stands out quite a bit. And if it sounds like slapping flesh, which many are apt to think, well, it is. As it was Jerry Allison literally slapping his thigh. Every day it comes in at 136 beats per minute. Same as Richie Valens, I will wax poetic on Buddy Holly in part 3 of this three part series, but his influence could not be understated. He broke social norms for the racist ass South in the 1950s and played music that spoke to him, regardless of the forces that judged him for doing just that. I think Buddy Holly really nails what it feels like to be in love. Your love for that person is so exhilarating that every day is like a roller coaster, but you know that no matter what, you are dedicated to that person, those people, that love, and nothing is going to slow that down. This week's love homework is a another song about how it feels to be so exhilarated by love, Toothpaste Kisses by the Maccabees. So with toothpaste kisses and lines. And I will be saving the biopic choice for the final part of this three-part series. And that's it, the end of another love song history lesson. If you like what you learned and you'd like to continue learning, subscribe, hit the bell, drop a like below, and join me again next week for the history of a love song we all know and love. Until next time, Remember to be careful of which form of transportation you take. And remember, you heard it in a love song.